different ways of doing that. Yeah. So. You see that call. <laughs> All right. Well, it's one o'clock, uh, John. So if you want to, we're recording now, dear. Get started. To kind of, are you in the general uh, introduction? Sandra Brisano decided to do a webinar on her activity, and uh, the U.S. Society for Ecological Economics has been very interested in getting practitioners to get more involved in our core activities. So Tanya is certainly a practitioner, uh, though she has good credentials, which she'll tell you a bit about, Sigrid Stegel, uh, and her background. So Tanya, take it away. Right. So I wasn't going to spend too much time on introducing myself, but I can. Um, Two, three sentences. Um, my name is Tanya Briseno. I'm an ecological economist. I did my master's in ecological economics with a Sigrid Stoll in uh, Leeds uh, University in the UK. Um, then I did my PhD at uh, Université de Montréal in Montreal. Um, in environmental economics, I also worked for the National Roundtable on the Environment and the Economy in Canada back in the day before it was dissolved, and I think around 2012 it was dissolved, and I'm working with Earth Economics um, that I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, through the presentation. Uh, but so to the topic of the presentation, um, valuing ecosystem services in the Mississippi River, Basin. Um, we are um, specialized in the valuation of ecosystem services across the country and internationally. And today we'll be working through some case studies uh, along the Mississippi River, from the Upper Mississippi River to Delta, and so what kind of uh, challenges, concerns, and methods we employ in translating uh, some of the ecological consistent challenges into ecosystem service values. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about economics and who we are. And we apply ecological economics to uh, projects on the ground, looking at how we can reconcile ecological conservation efforts with economic development. Um, we have a very broad range of projects. We work with different organizations. Uh, mostly with government agencies, but also with uh, private firms and different interest groups in help helping them tackle some of the complexities and conflicts that often arise between ecological conservation efforts and economic development. Um, our general approach, uh, we have three general um, approaches to our work. Uh, so number one, we carry a lot of uh, awareness building activities, so workshops and training sessions on what are the concepts of ecosystem services, how can they be valued economically, um, how can they be used to address um, different problems we may have on the ground, so a lot of just uh, socializing of the concepts and methods across uh, diverse audiences. Some of our work, however, is really place-based analysis, so looking at specific geographies it, where the ecosystem service framework can be applied to understand how to maximize value or what kind of uh, costs may arise uh, through an environmental a project with an environmental impact. So um, our main approach is to go, and we've got a set of ecosystem service categories um, we work uh, high, uh, a lot with GIS mapping and integrated environmental attributes into the mapping of ecosystem services. And then we have an extensive database of um, evaluation studies that allows us to draw both for different geographies and apply general estimates for how value can increase or decrease. And only a lot of our results of our analysis is translated into policy implications. So we play um, a role in bridging kind of place-based projects with a larger level policy. For example, we're working closely with FEMA and FEMA grants in how conservation um, effort, conservation projects can apply for disaster risk mitigation grants 
or post-disaster recovery. We work with state agencies in how their economic development plans can integrate some of this ecosystem service values. Uh, we design um, mechanisms or finance strategies for conservation groups, so really to do something actionable from the analysis that, that we do uh, through different geographies. And so, although we have a very uh, large um, list of projects throughout the country and abroad, today we'll be focusing on two recent uh, projects that we have conducted along the Mississippi River. Actually, one that we have conducted and one that is currently ongoing. Um, so, the first project uh, that I'll be referring to um, it's a project we conducted with the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority of Louisiana, uh, who are currently um, looking at uh, coastal um, conservation efforts. And one of their um, projects was the creation of sediment diversion uh, infrastructure, sediment diversion projects along the Mississippi River Delta as a way to mimic uh, land creation in the Delta. So I'll discuss kind of what the problem, what the goals and uh, some of the findings from uh, sediment diversions along the Mississippi River for the Delta. And the other project is farther up the Mississippi River, uh, looking at the economic impacts of expanding navigation infrastructure farther the river and what are the ecological and economic impacts of some of these uh, structures. Two of the questions um, that I will be asking through the presentation um, are firstly, what are the special characteristics of uh, water-related ecosystem services uh, in the Mississippi River? So how do we treat water-related ecosystem services generally and then more specifically within the Mississippi River. And so we get a sense for how ecosystem services um, can be framed and the question how helpful are the approach to uh, addressing the challenges of the Mississippi River uh, ecological challenges mostly and some of the economic needs that we also need to think about uh, for this geography. So, be the first uh, question, um, what are the special characteristics of related ecosystem services? Um, here we really focus on uh, three qualities of uh, water related ecosystem services, or three attributes, if you will, of these types of ecosystem services. Um, this uh, difficulty in terms of how to approach water-related ecosystem services because water is pretty much everywhere. It's on everything. It enables almost every ecosystem service. And so therefore, how to treat it becomes a kind of complex um, question methodologically when you think the ecosystem service framework. We have there's many times a thin balance in terms of how much water, or what quantity, or in what ways we need it so that it provides a good or a service to communities. And so, speaking to difficulties, the three elements that um, I'll be emphasizing, and mostly the one element that we'll, we'll be emphasizing through the one challenge we'll be looking at today is that conveyance quality. And this is much of just a water-related ecosystem service, but it's about a watershed structure. So that quality of conveying with uh, uh, that water carries, how that quality can have a good and a bad through uh, translating them into um, economic values. So we have to think about what is that, what are the convenience properties of this watershed? Secondly, what are the quality, water quality characteristics that make it be able to put some of these ecosystem services that um, we identified? And then the attribute of how much water is needed to provide different ecosystem services. So I think these are three key 
um, biophysical uh, areas to create a, a, a format for studying so that we can um, easily or we can translate them into ecosystem services. At Earth Economics, we work with a um, one category framework um, of ecosystem services. This is a research to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, or what TIB is using. So we begin with a, a general framework of 21. There's sometimes some variation. Um, somebody's microphone is on. Somebody's microphone. I think it's on, but I'll continue. Um, so uh, this is the, the categories that we are working kind of begin with uh, our assessments. As we see there are at least three ecosystem services with the term water. So you have water storage capacity, we have water quality as an end in itself, and the property of of cleaning it, capturing it, and supplying it to different places. Um, look at some other frameworks um, that exist out there. I think this is a very um, common and cited one, cited framework for studying water-related ecosystem services. Um, it really starts with identifying the different um, ecological and hydrological functions that a river system uh, can ca can uh, carry out, um, how these different ecological functions then translate into attributes that are key for us to determine ecosystem services. So here we see kind of similar um, uh, ones for the attributes that we highlighted at the beginning in terms of quantity, how much water there is, the quality. Here we see kind of the conveyance uh, and kind of supply attribute part be slightly different. Uh, here really used in terms of location, where is the water and time in terms of uh, here's the, when what flows and at what time it is. So it's a slightly different approach to classifying uh, ecological systems into um, goods and services. And, and here is a slightly different category as well in terms of what the water services may be in terms of they bring water for different uses or using the water within water should be for nutrition or for habitat, um, the problems with excess water and other kind of supporting services and spiritual. I think sometimes it's a better framework. It really depends on what the question is and how you want to approach it. Here is a quick visualization of uh, what we're looking at before with Roman's um, framework in terms of really thinking about all the biophysical attributes that can come into play when identifying the water service that you're looking at. So the entire watershed and its um, multiple attributes can perform one function, that of collecting water, for example, and therefore for supply water, and perhaps for drinking water purposes. How do we treat uh, some of these attributes of uh, water systems when we are translating them into um, end products? Um, here I'll go over our common approach for speaking to impacts of water quality. And the same thing is that through water quality, we we open up and like kind of call another set of very different indicators of measurements that make up water quality. So water quality is also not a straightforward uh, end or a straightforward condition that we measure. Every activity requires or benefits from um, different makeups of uh, uh, composition. So we can talk about nutrient levels. Levels. We can talk about pathogens, turbidity, all these different things we can measure across water systems will have an implication for different products. Um, here, this example, I believe, is the Water Resource Centers Index. So our approach is to create 
entities that summarize a lot of the information on the state of the water uh, with some uh, kind of the, the measurement that would be required or that could be used or could be extracted for uh, a given site, uh, what the measurement ideal would be, and a weight, weight system that you can give to uh, different measurements uh, to generate a water quality value. And this isn't necessarily generalizable to all um, ecosystem services. Um, in this case, uh, I think the specific use is for recreation. So uh, in uh, recreation, lots of what activities you can do, uh, given different um, uh, water quality measures, you can see kind of what may be a more ideal state or a more valuable uh, state of the water for different recreation activities therefore uh, allowing uh, a scale to be put into place to translate water quality to a uh, recreation services. In terms of uh, water quantity, um, we also see um, a lot of challenges in speaking to what's of value when it comes to quantity uh, of desired. Um, there are too much water is not you have floods and a lot of damage can be created through excess water. Um, too little water, of course, it's an it's critical um, crisis that can be generated with too little water. Uh, so, what is kind of the optimal balance of water quantity? In, in, in what forms do we value it? Interesting thing that I um, have noted through our applications of water services is that there. And uh, research I could find where you have um, the curves built for water services. Given that water services are highly regulated, services, utilities are highly regulated, isn't really a place where you can see kind of the willingness to pay for the uh, ounce of water available. Of course, utilities have to work through um, the stretch capacities that they may have for the reservoirs for uh, responding to um, uh, kind of fluctuating needs. Uh, so there's some data you can draw for that, or there are some uh, contingency um, version, um, contingent valuation uh, studies that look at people needs to pay, but it's really hard to construct the demand curve for water. So it's a challenging question that I, I think we're still working through in, in terms of how to value it. We can value water interruptions, and that's probably the place where we can see what has happened when an industry doesn't have enough water to operate, bringing it to a halt, or where there's kind of a, a water to be transported artificially from elsewhere and what those replacement costs were. And um, the one attribute that I really want to emphasize today is that of uh, the conveyance attribute of bringing water to different places uh, through the bicycle structure of the watershed. So here, as I mentioned before, you can also frame it in terms of tying on location of water and nutrients in different places. It really focuses on the physical structure of the river. And looking at that key ecological function that rivers have of spreading water nutrients across floodplains and really recognizing that rivers are very dynamic and the ecological uh, balance that is sought through the system to kind of replenish soils and to uh, distribute uh, water and nutrients across large areas, but at the same time that generating um, to societies in terms of very uh, floods or just change of course of rivers and difficulties for navigation. So how we reconcile those different needs for ecosystem services. The quick visual that I kind of always think about when looking at all the measurements of watersheds and water systems, how those will have to be mapped into different end products. And, it's a different way to think about multiple attributes. The multi-attribute pricing methodology um, used in marketing and how that is applicable to the ecosystem service valuation, especially in water-related services. But to grab some of this theory, 
uh, with the context of this presentation, uh, we're looking at the Mississippi River. And uh, the one focus I'm going to start with is uh, that challenge of uh, sediment transport and maintaining a sediment balance um, across the river. So the Mississippi River drains um, about 40% of the country of the United States, a major river system. However, it's also a highly altered river system. It has over 17,000 dams and res reservoirs across the basin, and it has over 3,000 miles of levees. Highly um, manipulated um, in terms of keeping it to certain ecosystem services that are of um, high value to the country. Mainly, it's a very important navigation way uh, to be able to transport goods from across the country. Uh, there are big concerns in terms of flood control. So as there is land development, uh, there's a, a big need for controlling some of this natural ecological processes of uh, kind of moving and spreading nutrients around. And so looking at the impact of land logs and dumps and levees, um, what do we see uh, in both being validators for critical ecosystem services, but also kind of creating some ecological concerns um, as they're artificially manipulated. Much of the sediment is trapped and nutrients are trapped, and we see problems elsewhere. For example, um, I think this is no news to anybody, but land loss in the Mississippi River data, uh, has been astronomic in the past 200 years. I think the catchphrase that we hear is that about every is that every hour a football field of land is lost in the delta? So look at how change has happened since the 1800s over time, and we see the inability to spread uh, some of these nutrients and create land down through the ecological dynamics of, of the river. Uh, we can see you know, the change that is being experienced downstream. Uh, there is less and less land, and communities are then put at risk, just losing the physical spaces where they live, and also being a lot more prone to uh, storms and other, other risks uh, from land loss. So again, a, a visual and how different ecosystem services map onto some of these uh, changes in attributes of the hydrological system. So I'm not going to walk through all of them. I started kind of putting this together, and I said, well, this is just going to take the whole presentation to kind of start mapping every ecosystem service to the, uh, change in some of these attributes. But, um, well, for example, we can see uh, how energy creation is really a, re a requirement of obstructing the river flow, um, channeling that energy for the creation of, of that ecosystem service, which at the end it, it is an ecosystem service, therefore altering quantity and quality, and how of these um, attributes interact with ecosystem services, kind of like this and, and from another visualization, um, let's say. Um, I think maybe a, a better graphic is going back to the ecosystem service flower, where a lot of these challenges really emerge out of uh, an overemphasis in certain ecosystem services such as navigation or flood damage to the detriment of others, such as uh, downstream soil formation or uh, impacts for habitat, uh, for example, many migratory species that can now uh, use the river due to the main um, locks and dams that are placed on them. So we have to understand how the entire flower of the ecosystem service um, provisioning system is being compromised and kind of where the big emphasis is being put and where it is being uh, neglected. So the change um, that we face here in this uh, kind of state of the world is how do we measure this impact, uh, specifically economically, how do we value it? And um, to begin, um, we've seen a big emphasis again on navigation as I was explaining, so many of the projects on the Mississippi River are matched by the Army Corps of Engineers um, that require benefit cost analysis for the construction of all of these um, infrastructure types. And they have their principles and guidelines 
guidance, guidelines, documents that kind of um, guide what should be considered a cost and a benefit. And so when it comes to navigation infrastructure, the real emphasis is on a cost differential that using navigation as a transportation mode has over other modes of transport, for example, a rail. So there's a gain in savings that may be cheaper to transport it through a bus than rail, then that cost differential is measured as the economic gain. And it's to justify the creation of most of these uh, locks and dams along the river. Now, the beneficiary for most of these will primarily are the industries utilizing the transport modes. And of course, there will be some of that uh, gain transferred on to consumers that may be um, national or maybe international. And we just know that the whole way that um, they might trickle down, but primarily the direct uh, beneficiaries are kind of the users of the transport system. At the same time, we've got a kind of development and the risks that not having some of these levies has for uh, my communities. What are the costs that are not systematically accounted for? It's just uh, an example for a rehabilitation project that we are looking at uh, with the Army Corps along the upper Mississippi, a very small stretch about uh, about no more or between uh, 10 to 30 miles of river with an estimated cost of $5 billion. So these are the types of costs that are not initially taken into account in the benefit cost analysis carried out for any of this navigation infrastructure uh, projects put forth. Other costs that are not considered are, for example, dredging costs. So build this infrastructure, we block a lot of the cement, and meanwhile, we have this ecological cost, but there are also direct financial costs uh, in terms of uh, dredging. I think hundreds of millions of dollars are spent Army Corps in being um, across the Mississippi River. And so how are those uh, incorporated into the operation and maintenance cost forecast for their benefit cost analysis? And kind of what we emphasize uh, more uh, through the ecosystem service version are the loss of habitat and other um, loss, both against uh, upstream or, or downstream, downstream. So go over some of our initial analysis for a specific navigation project in the Upper, upper Mississippi River. Um, the site is called uh, Melvin Price. It used to be Lock and Dam 26. Um, the emphasize these are preliminary results so this is an ongoing project now. Uh, it should, uh, we should be giving uh, it up by the end of the year. So please, a big disclaimer that uh, the values I present for now are preliminary and not final in any way or to be used uh, and distributed as an assessment itself. But just to give you an idea for how we approach the problem and how the, me how the methodology is employed and the range of value loss that we are are able to um, see through our approach. Looking at a specific site where a negation infrastructure project, a negation expansion infra infrastructure project was to be approved. The approval required or was, was decided on through a benefit cost analysis in terms of what would be um, the impact of expanding um, infrastructure, therefore expand navigation, and uh, what would be the benefits. Our approach uh, was limited to a cover range approach through uh, a given geography, a uh, given data limitations, and how the land cover change translated into ecosystem service changes. And he just put a kind of a sort of one, just one year of uh, valuing the loss of ecosystem services could be about $2 million. I just picked one year just to give you a, an annual value, but it, it accumulates over time. And so the ecosystem service losses that we see are real and sometimes significant. So uh, a better understanding of how the methodology um, is employed, uh, we first have to characterize the land cover for which we have data uh, in terms of land cover change over time. So there's the site where the infrastructure was to be built, and here's kind of the next 
uh, dam dam that to that uh, uh, it was going across the um, upper Mississippi River. Here is the Illinois River. Uh, so looking at this land cover change over time, since Melvin Price was constructed, we seek to see how the land itself changed, and therefore how ecosystem services change as a consequence of this land cover. I won't spend time looking at the specific changes, but so we have one state of the world goes characterized by a given uh, type of land cover classification change into a, a different site. So we're working with the same categories and we just see kind of a change in distribution of uh, uh, land cover type. And the rationale or the premise behind the evaluation is that there are a set of ecosystem services that are associated with free-flowing rivers and a different set of ecosystem services that are associated with uh, dammed rivers. So after reviewing um, a lot of literature, looking at how people perceive benefits, how ecologists uh, benefits, so I think we uh, included um, maybe half a dozen studies in um, creating this table in identifying the different sets of ecosystem services that conceptually could be associated with the different types of rivers. Raising that free-flowing rivers are very rare and do not exist and is more uh, kind of originally more free-flowing rivers than others that are kind of more obstructed. So um, again, uh, kind of to be uh, qualified with the fact that, that we're, the streams aren't real, but there's kind of some between. Uh, so for example, um, you know, free-flowing rivers tend to have very intrinsic views different types of fish species are found where you can see migratory species and native species with uh, less obstructed rivers. Creation uh, types are very different, um, you know, more kind of uh, whitewater rafting, canoeing, kayaking, uh, more wildlife viewing, whereas recreation is more kind of reservoir based, uh, more, more, bone, more motorized boating, a uh, different type of fishing. Um, so we won't go through the whole um, table. And the main uh, point is that different ecosystem services with different values uh, can be associated with the different types. And as they move from one end of the spectrum to the other, we start to see a change in the composition and value associated with uh, these types of ecosystem services. Um, so again, conceptually, to look at um, how the Mississippi River has changed uh, from the late 1800s, 1890 versus 2011. These are two shots in time. So just looking at the two years as they compare to each other, without uh, accounting for many of the subtle differences between a free-flowing river and a dammed river, um, we see here a change in value of uh, $32 million of ecosystem services. So every one of the recovery types of its own set of ecosystem services, and therefore, as we see uh, a transition kind of to more developed land, to more agriculture, to more, um, I think we have more, uh, I think mainly that places we might see gain, and then we see a change in value. We've struggled out with how to measure the fluidity of a river versus the obstructed um, obstruct level of a river. So it's really a, a function of so many different attributes. Um, started to gravitate uh, towards water depth in terms of what the water is versus deeper, but we could really include the flow measure. And so it's been a really big challenge on how to take a specific site and uh, marginally measure the change from one end of the spectrum from more free flow to free flow through measures on the ground that can be found for the end. I think for now what we could do is just qualitatively speak about some of the loss of ecosystem services, but we were really limited in terms of what a land cover based approach could do. Now, a little bit of a change in direction to look farther down at the delta. 
and maybe see how we can start tying in some of these upstream problems with the downstream problems. So go over very quickly um, the, a project conducted for the Coastal Protection Restoration Authority of Louisiana, where we're looking to mimic land creation, ecological land creation by the Delta by opening up the river uh, to sediment diversions. Uh, here in this map, we can see the Mississippi River Delta, the bird's foot, the location where the diversions were to be constructed to enable the creation of wetlands here uh, up the, the river, not really up, but just here up uh, under the bird's foot. Um, so this was a very big investment, uh, the largest investment that CPL was going to engage, understanding the value of ecological processes for land building and trying to mimic them. So the diversions were estimated at a conservative estimate of $2 billion. And so in order to carry out such an investment, there was uh, obviously a need to understand kind of what the benefits and costs would be and whether the investment would be justifiable. Here we did uh, analysis of many different industries. We look at fishing, trees, recreation, water supply in terms of water utilities. Uh, and I don't even remember, no, it's been two years since we finalized um, the project. But I'm going to focus on a couple of uh, benefits that we identified through um, kind of this ecological process or kind of imitating ecological processes of land building. So in terms of uh, where the diversions would be built and kind of where the, uh, the and creation would be concentrated, it would be to uh, see creation kind of t towards the continental uh, Louisiana or farther up uh, the river. And uh, to the element uh, of uh, the bird's foot, um, which has almost irreversible land loss. So maybe this map is a little bit of explaining, but this is a forecast of, of uh, wetland amounts, let's say, uh, over the next 50 years. Creating the expense of the four versions as they operate compared to no versions. So, uh, Within of the four diversions, we would see a lot of marsh being created up here, and a lot of marsh being lost out at the bird's foot. There is a lot of land loss that is happening irrespective because the diversions are not enough to reverse land loss, so you can't really stop seeing the land loss uh, by this one project on its own, but really looking at the value that is added by uh, allowing um, kind of more distributed here across the um, upper upper portion of the bird's foot um, and what values would be. So here the finding for the storm protection is that these are a lot more effective for storm buffering as the concentration of wetlands is a critical attribute for storm uh, buffering effectiveness and so what the value would be, this analysis got what the value would be for storm protection uh, in terms of building these diversions versus not building them. And maybe another kind of difficult graph to explain, but um, because many scenarios, I think the main point here is that the value created in ecosystem services in general was uh, significant. These are uh, snapshots of ecosystem service value across uh, uh, the 50-year forecast of the models that we used. Uh, so at every time, it's just that there's a value in creating an ecosystem services by creating the diversions versus not doing anything, which is the orange line here. Basically, no ecosystem services would be created. If any, they would be lost. But through the creation of wetlands across the areas, we could expect to see a value at year 50 of 250. This is not cumulative, so just at year, at year 40, about uh, 220. Uh, so every year, there will be significant value gain, um, allowing kind of this sand to move downstream and um, the uh, creation 
person. Another um, important finding from using the ecosystem service framework for looking at these challenges is that we're able to identify the beneficiaries and in some cases kind of the victims of the loss of ecosystem service value. And so kind of stepping back and taking a broader picture of uh, some of the findings that we see that um, we see there's a lot of benefit to the navigation industry, a lot of benefit to agriculture through uh, commodity transport and through um, maybe flood control uh, in some cases, although in some cases it's a loss through the loss in soil quality. And then downstream we see some of this kind of victims of the loss in ecosystem services when we see the um, storm protection um, benefit of wetlands be compromised as a result of the sediment not being able to flow downstream. We see a big impact on uh, fisheries downstream that really require some of this wetlands for a nursery and habitat. And these are also extremely uh, important in this nationwide. By not taking really like a, a scale or a larger view of the ecological problems and the interconnectedness between uh, how the, the ecological functions work, we can also end up um, seeing a lot of national value loss, economic national value loss, as we have to hundreds of uh, millions of dollars in um, increasing storm damage or fisheries impacts. And so kind of the benefit of really taking a, a bigger look at what um, are. So I haven't really stepped back and we're constantly redesigning our vision for different um, issues we're working on. And I, this is kind of precipitate analysis uh, because uh, some of our projects are still, or the main thing that I want to tie in is still ongoing. Uh, but some general recommendations that uh, we are expecting to see, uh, well, number one, uh, our case to work with Army Corps of Engineers in expanding that is covered within a benefit cost analysis, especially for built infrastructure, as we're able to highlight uh, some of the uh, costs that may not be accounted for and some of the benefits that kind of also translate into costs. Uh, then we should be able to have more information to make more informed decision making about uh, what the impact of these infrastructure projects are. And as I was just describing earlier, the importance of looking at the scale of the ecological problems. So even with this one site for this one navigation project, we're limited by the fact that every benefit cost analysis has a very small boundary for the impact that are considered. So downstream impacts do not make part of the, uh, of the study of the uh, benefit cost analysis and uh, sometimes of the environmental impact statement of the environmental impact assessment, uh, they can expand the scale of the impact, but not really to kind of far down as downstream uh, wetland loss. So it still really remains very limited in, in the scale of the study. Uh, that we are studying these problems at. And the value and the need to engage different stakeholders and industries in decision making and even the value that collaborations between different groups um, that these can create to work uh, alongside other industries like the navigation industry, the Army Corps of Engineers to kind of think about solutions that uh, uh, incorporate cost and benefits across uh, different sectors of the economy. So I'm impressed that I think I did very fairly good timing. Um, I'll open up for questions, uh, but I think first I should announce the next webinar. Uh, questions with this slide uh, in terms of keeping aware of what the next webinar will be. Uh, yeah, as we just up and we reached a 45 minute mark, I'd like to open up for um, answer comments. Perfect. <laughs> Great. Are you handling the, the answer?
answer part. Everybody, turn your mic in and give a question. On myself, uh, wet in St. Paul, uh, you mentioned that about 80% of ecosystem service valuation studies are benefits transfer. Do you think your ability will be higher now that you have, let's say, a, a little inventory? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, there are any more people by having different focus areas. So I think I missed this at the introduction. Uh, the focus area that I lead is the Gulf Coast, uh, Gulf of Mexico Coast. By being able to carry out more projects, we're able to collect a larger library of all the studies that are conducted across a specific geography. And uh, so benefit transfer, especially in the academic community, um, uh, heavily criticized for not being able to incorporate any of the unique elements of a given site. And uh, sometimes it can become an issue. I think maybe where I've seen it become issues maybe in litigation cases or in maybe location. Um, but uh, to answer your question, as our collection of studies grows and we're able to really identify kind of where the ranges, where outliers are, and the more number of studies informing our uh, specific ecosystem service values. It is going to increase the validity of the numbers we're able to generate um, by uh, a careful organization and collection of as many studies as can, and by having this focus, yes, uh, re kind of reoccurring um, place that we study, then um, our aim is to start kind of addressing some of the errors that can. Uh, Sometimes post problems, our numbers can be used. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. A question? A lot of things went by. <laughs> this is Moss in here. I, have, I do have a question, um, and it's sort of building on the last set of comments. And it would be what do you see as being the best sources of uncertainty in the estimate? that you've generated? Okay. Well, there's a lot of um, uncertainty with precise uh, numbers. Um, what the biggest sources of uncertainty are? I can speak maybe to begin with, with the delta valuation, and where we saw kind of uh, at year 50, we have a 250 million increase in value. I think a lot of the uncertainty in this case has come from the, I'm going to bring somebody else, but the biophysical um, you know, of what the land will look like. So even though we can attribute, we've got three values for wetlands depending on their salinity gradient. And you understand kind of what because the services are more uh, common in different uh, wetland types. I think we, I, there is uncertainty on whether you know some of these activities are taking place. You know, are duck hunters going as much to saline uh, now uh, wet in Texas as they are to Louisiana? I mean, those are the types of errors, errors of transfer that we can see. I think the biggest source of error is kind of projecting out biophysical models uh, for and cover into the future, and the farther out you go, then the more uncertainty there is. Um, that's for the delta. For the um, kind of retrospective analysis, um, in terms of looking at what the river was you know, 200 years ago, we are also very limited with the data that we can get, with the site images that we can get, with the GIS data. And we don't have any information that can help us qualify you know, water quality attributes or you know, more specific um, 
characteristics, so we really have to do very broad brush evaluation, very limited, but what can be categorized into this a very general land cover classification. Uh, so number one is just the lack of data to track change over time, and then the evaluation itself um, has all the limitations in terms of uh, representing the population, how to uh, really kind of find hot spots versus uh, other places that may not be as valuable. Um, but yeah, an answer of the data <laughs> available. Good. Anybody else? Go ahead. A question about the sediment diversion example. Mm -hmm. On the map, there was a lot of area loss that led to the area. Now, was that area lost as a result of sediment diversion, or would it be lost anyway? So, or was there a net, uh, uh, yeah. an absolute benefit, or it's just a net benefit from sediment diversion? Um, there is not absolute benefit. So the main finding that we got was that there is no land loss reversal. Lands will continue. What there was, a, I think we prevented the law that you, you could prevent the loss, if I remember correctly, of 40,000 acres of wetland by creating um, the diversion. But that wasn't necessarily where all the value gain was going to be um, good at two, is not to the only 40,000 acres because different acres have different potential for ecosystem service creation. So it was more about where the wetlands be located as opposed to without the diversion. So without the diversions you'd see a little bit less of loss down here at the bird's foot. Which you would see more land kind of closer up to uh, the new wetlands so they're gonna develop to the to the continental um and, and so as the Critical importance of value of having very highly concentrated and continuous in these places that would be able to uh, make a difference in terms of storm protection and um, other ecosystem services. That was kind of the main goal of these places because by having it be so levied up and throwing out all the cement down here, a lot of it just gets swept away into the open ocean. Or you know, it exacerbates the problem of uh, the dead zone in the Gulf Coast, mm. uh, whereas there's a lot of nutrient deprivation up here where these wetlands are not getting the nutrients they should be getting uh, because of the highly obstructed channelization of the river. So these wetlands can perform important ecological functions by a little bit of the nutrients that they are being deprived of. Hmm. A question on the chat from Claudio. Is that, did you use non-market valuation at all? And if not, why not? We did. So that is really our core um, area of study. And so what we collect, we've got, um, I don't know the exact number, but it was several thousand studies uh, collected in a database. <clears throat> Most of them are non-market valuations. So a lot of um, content valuation studies and willingness to pay for um, recreation and water quality. So all the 21 ecosystem services, we've got a lot of travel cost analysis, reveal preference analysis. So I would say that at least uh, three quarters of our ecosystem service values were on market valuations for consumer surplus gain. And then we have uh, the rest that are really market-based analysis. Most of the market-based analysis were fishing. So what would be the impact for the fisheries industries from the fisherman to the final consumer at the restaurant? So we divided up our findings in market um, value impacts or market impacts and non-market impacts that uh, tend to benefit some of the less um, wealthy players. Or, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in the mm -hmm. We have a question on the chat from Cedar. 
What modeling tools did you use? Open source, proprietary, to build your models in house. Uh, modeling, so there's, because I talked about so many things, there's a lot of modeling <laughs> involved. Um, all of the biophysical modeling was done by partners, so we worked with the Watt Institute that uses a hydrodynamic modeling from the Paris, Delft 3D, to project how sediment distribution would be um, kind of allocated under different scenarios. So that was done by us. I don't think they're open source. I think they constructed this for um, CRA through the Water Institute. All of their values and scenarios and results to the very fine level are available publicly. You just need to write to CRA and request them with a reason on how they are going to be used. So they're publicly available, the results themselves. When it comes to biophysical modeling and ASM projects, so what we do for the valuation itself is we've got this database of values, and if we can call it thing, uh, then we do the economic uh, valuation or modeling ourselves at house. And so it's not open source, but all the stats are publicly available, and we do provide a bibliography of where each value came from what study. Uh, to allow um, you know, replication or um, review of our work, uh, but if it transfer is gone in house. Okay. Well, I'm going to hold people uh, with a few more minutes. Uh, I, I was one of the founding fathers of an environmental studies program, which had to get natural and social scientists together in this program. Now, I used the water quality index in some of my research, and uh, the weights of the different water attributes were a Delphi method. And the hydrologists thought that that was pure crap, that it had no place in science, that it was only scientific measurement that could determine the, the, the seat of the of river or the creek. So how do others feel about that? The opinion. It was done in the Delphi method, which takes experts in the field to say that DOD is worth, let's say, 0.4 of the degree of the of the water body. Mm -hmm. what, what was the method that they were criticizing? The Delphi method. It's a method in management. It's really it. It's a method where you get the experts to figure out, you know, what kind of uh, uh, handheld devices going to work with people or something like that. You ask the experts and they have opinions about it. Mm -hmm. So somebody decided that, that this group together, maybe 20 people, experts in the field said, point four for BOD. Now, crap or not? I don't think anybody's going to say that it is in this group, but I, I don't want to speak for other people. Well, um, we, I ended up breaking up the environmental study program with that. The social scientists went one way, the natural sciences went the other way. What, what the, con the problem that we usually face in the absence of data is to really distort to this uh, expert opinion. Um, right. Because if, if we don't have a better solution, then um, we start with that and kind of refine as time goes on as, as new projects prove otherwise as more primary data is collected for um, validating the the effect that a water quality attribute can have on a final good and service. So we are big fans of the expert opinion consensus. <laughs> well, <laughs> in uh, this so market, <laughs> we lack so much data, and really that is our big, biggest source of uncertainty. The OD measurements are going to value themselves. Mm -hmm. exactly. So I think she's wrong. wrong. Just like your <laughs> Okay. But anybody else? One minute left. Question: How did you deal with uh, discounting future values? So you said this has a 50-year time frame. Yes, we did do discounting. So we did a 2% discount uh, rate for this product. Uh, we generally have a lot of heated debates about what are what should be the appropriate discount rate. 
us and also with other agencies. So in the past, we've had problems with EPA, uh, who will not accept any evaluation that does not discount the future, and that two percent is considered too low. Um, so every agent and every client has different demands. Our um, default um, decision when the client doesn't have strong um, requirements, then it will be to use a 2% discount rate for the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, that we're going to end. Thank you, Tanya. It was okay. deep, deep, wide, well spoken. Thank you. Did it. And I hope you all took some time to listen. So. If any other questions, feel free to email me. I'd be happy to share the reports themselves or data or answer other questions. Okay. Earth economics. Thank you. All right. Thank you, folks. I'm going to end right now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.